Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Ron Ackerman. I'm the director of the Institute for Public Health and Medicine. And uh, this is our once a year opportunity to step back and uh, we call it the state of IFAM address. It's really more one of uh, taking an inventory of, of what the Institute now represents and, and where it's come from. Uh, this year marks the 12th year of IFAM. And I'm gonna talk a bit about the sort of history of IFAM in that 12 year period. Um, we do have a Zoom audience. I think everything's going okay there. Um, we, uh, I invite people to, you know, stop me, raise your hand, ask questions at any point. On the Zoom, uh, the way to enter a question is through the Q&A, uh, which is the, uh, not the chat function. Uh, we don't monitor the chat, but if you can use the Q&A icon on the Zoom screen, uh, enter your questions and we'll come back to those at the end of the presentation. Um, I do realize that we're starting a little bit late because of the other lecture leaving a bit late. Um, if you have to leave uh, toward the end, I understand. I won't take it personally as a, uh, that you didn't like the presentation, hopefully. Um, so why don't we jump in and get started? I guess I'll say for those who might leave that um, please do join us uh, if you're um, not already aware and planning. We do have a IFAM holiday party. Uh, it's tomorrow at two o'clock at D4, just off campus. So please stop by. Uh, should be a fun time. Um, all right. So uh, without any further delay, I want to, again, uh, frame this as really a, a looking back of uh, what really is, uh, a, we're reaching our 12th year and, and celebrating IFAM's growth and impact. It's not as if we've reached a plateau, but I like to think of how we've gotten to where we are today in 2023 and what opportunity that is to think about the future. So thinking of it as always a stopping point or an inflection point in our perspective. Um, if one came here today and uh, was told there's this institute and you went on the website and looked for it, you would find that there's 18 centers in the, in the Institute for Public Health and Medicine. Um, and you might just be uh, overwhelmed with, uh, you know, what, what exactly is this? Is it just a, a label for these 18 centers? Is it something that um, represents more? Is there a strategy behind it? And, and how did this come to be? Uh, and, I, and I'd like to talk a bit about that today. Um, I will say to, just to start off that IFAM is not uh, a, a label, it's not a title, it's not a place, uh, it's not um, a representation of one or two or five people or a couple of research programs on campus that we think are important. Uh, it is an army, it is all of you. Uh, it really constitutes about 500 faculty members across 50 divisions and departments uh, in six Northwestern schools, uh, hundreds of staff members uh, that support research and our educational mission, and, uh, and literally hundreds of community partners and stakeholders. Uh, so it, uh, everything I'm gonna talk about today is really a representation of the collective work and impact of, of all of those individuals. Uh, when we started in the early years of the Institute, uh, we had um, really a, just a small subset of these. I think it was eight or nine centers initially uh, when we established IFAM in 2012. And over the first few years, we would go through and talk about each center, who was hired, what are the research projects, what's happening in that center, what's it about. With 18 centers, that becomes really difficult. So I'm gonna talk at a more thematic level. I can't mention every name. I can't mention every new research project. I'm gonna highlight some things that really help to uh, underscore some themes I think are important to reflect upon as uh, we think about the Institute today in 2023. Um, so I'll move on and think uh, really what this historical perspective is, is to take us back to 2011. 2011 happens to be the year that I came to Northwestern University. How many people were here in 2011? Can I see a show of hands? About maybe 15% of the audience in the room. Obviously, I can't see the hands being raised on the Zoom, but that's not surprising. We have grown dramatically as an institution over the last uh, 12 years, and a lot of people weren't here before there was IFAM. 
So there was public and population health research uh, and education going on at our School of Medicine and on our campus in 2011. And I showed up in about August. Uh, it was a time where there was an interim dean. Uh, I, I, I showed up after spending eight years at Indiana University School of Medicine, where I was um, leading my own research programs in areas of chronic disease prevention for adults. Uh, it's research that benefits from being um, uh, proximate to large po and diverse populations. And I, I'm really interested in the interface between healthcare delivery and communities. So for me, it made sense to move to a place like Chicago because there's lots of health systems, lots of diverse communities and lots of opportunities to, uh, to evaluate chronic disease prevention opportunities. I also was the director of the community engagement program for the CTSA at Indiana University. Um, and there was an opportunity to, that opened up in a relatively new program within NUCATS uh, around uh, resources and services for community engagement. It was about building partnerships with community organizations, uh, helping to prepare and train them, and, and for um, really it's a capacity building and consulting around community engagement. It was kind of uh, fundamental bread and butter around community engagement. It, it included both uh, clinical practices and, and uh, more grassroots community organizations and public agencies. It was a great opportunity to do what I had been doing and learning about and bring that work to Chicago. Um, so when I came, I was really focused primarily on moving grants and, and getting relocated to a new city. And um, I did know, and I came here because there were departmental strengths in areas of epidemiology and population health research in, in uh, Department of Preventive Medicine that dated back uh, several decades. There was pockets of health services and behavioral research in multiple departments like Department of Medicine, Department of Surgery, Department of Pediatrics, and some others. There was an MPH program that had been up and running and, and uh, it had uh, national accreditation uh, uh, for um, about 11 years in 2011. And then um, there was a relatively new strength in psychometrics and measurement science in this department that had been established in 2009 called Medical Social Sciences. Um, there was also a Center for Healthcare Studies that had been collaborating across multiple schools for about 20 years, but had moved onto our campus in about 2003, uh, the Center for Healthcare Studies. And, th and then um, NUCATS, as I said, was sort of up and running in about 2007 and funded in 2008 for the first time. So this is, you know, a handful of things. They're in different parts of our campus. They're not coordinated, not networked. And just to think back, it seems like ancient history now. Um, 2011, um, you know, was the year when uh, Game of Thrones was in season one and we learned about Ned Stark and saw him lose his head and uh, which was shocking uh, and uh, we, uh, the number one movie that year was Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part two. Uh, and Adele's Rolling in the Deep was the number one song. So, uh, you know, it is, it is a while ago. And if you think about that, I think most of you think, gosh, that's a long time ago. Um, but it's 12 years ago and, and that's kind of the state of, of arrival. And two and a half weeks after I came, there was an announcement that we had a new dean. This guy, Eric Nielsen, and he had come as the department chair from Vanderbilt and would lead our school. Um, and we knew he was a nephrologist and we knew he did, uh, you know, sort of not health services, population health and public health research. So we weren't sure what was going to what was going to happen next, but we we eagerly uh, awaited his arrival. And he came to us and he came to us surprisingly with this message within about two months of his arrival that there will be an institute for public health and medicine. Um, Eric came with the promise of doubling research and trying to integrate the mission of the medical school with the health delivery system and NMHC. Um, he knew that that would require investments in space and people and growing quickly in, in the wet lab area and in basic sciences and preclinical research takes time and it takes considerable investment but we could begin by organizing what he called the dry lab uh, and pull uh, health services, outcomes, population health policy, and those strengths I showed you before into one umbrella. Interestingly, as we formed IFAM, the words he used on this page were that we would create a new environment 
out of many accomplished environments. So we're not just changing, we're not just creating a name or a label or something clever, we're actually changing the environment on our campus. And it will forever be an important part of our research enterprise. We're changing not just individual people or a department or establishing a program, but we're changing the very way that we operate. Um, and it will have an impact on generations to come. An investment in both research and training and the impact of that work on our campus and on our communities. Um, so we sat down and Eric pulled together people who had been leading some of those areas I showed you before on that page. Um, and there were eight folks, including Rex Chisholm, um, the vice dean of research and um, Bing was one of those folks. And as a new faculty member, I was surprised to be invited into the room, perhaps because David Baker, who was my division chief, was uh, one of the folks also as sort of an institutional leader in health services research within the Division of General Internal Medicine. Um, so I got into this room, this gang of eight, and we were tasked with um, identifying the strengths, pulling it under one umbrella, and forming this thing called an Institute of Public Health and Medicine. Um, which is precisely what we did. It was very transactional. It was very like, uh, you know, pull the people in, try to establish centers or realms or areas where we would do our work and to begin to think critically about where are the opportunities for growth. And, um, and, and it had to be at an organizational or enterprise level, not growth in a specific department, not in a specific research area, really lumpier areas like you know, like health services and outcomes, like policy, like, um, you, you know, population health sciences or epidemiology. And um, that's the sort of direction that we took in the early years is to form the Institute, build some infrastructure, research administration, pull the educational uh, strengths, several master's programs that were in different departments under one umbrella, so that we could administer them in a way that seemed more efficient, organized, and purposeful, taking us into the future. Um, we did this over the first couple of years, and we didn't always agree. I recall a specific moment where we were talking about different directions, and I said, well, that sounds kind of like, I'm not sure if that's the best way to invest you know, our immediate uh, our resources right now. I don't know. And I, I, it was a conversation I had, and I I don't think he will, you know, um, be upset with me to say it was with my division chief, Dave Baker. And, um, you know, we, we had this conversation and I, and I said something about, um, well, I'm not sure if that's going to be achievable. And I will tell you, like, the word aspiration, right, is, is something that's like um, purposeful, driving towards the future. Um, when used in academics, especially by organizational leaders, be careful when you hear it. What it means is something that's a little too idealistic, a little too dreamy, a little too out of reach. So instead of saying, that's aspirational, it was more, let me tell you, Ron, what's aspirational. A center for community health in a medical school. And what he meant by that is not that our mission wasn't about community impact, but rather people, like using our space and limited resources to build research programs around the priorities of communities seems like something that might happen 20 years from now. It doesn't sound like what we should be doing now. And remember the starting place where we were, it was very fragmented and um, you know, our strengths were in areas like epidemiology and um, health services, quintessential health services research. So we didn't always agree and um, I, I tell you this now because I wanna end on a, on a note later that the things that we think are really out of our reach today may really be achievable under something, this vision of something like IFAM with a collective group of, of people working collaboratively. And so um, many of the things that I'll leave you with at the end that we've accomplished were things we thought were incredibly aspirational in 2011. So um, the Center for Community Health, remarkably today, you know, like, uh, as I told you, you know, there, there was some activities in NUCATS before 2011. And, and um, the, uh, you know, the, most of those were consulting and trainings and capacity building activities, which were, which were really important. 
what IFAM was going to try to do was create a space where people sat and shared programmatic staff and built research programs uh, around community health priorities, uh, which would be different. And um, it's not that there weren't people doing that. They weren't brought together purposely to grow and to develop and have scale effects. Um, today, remarkably, something that seemed aspirational, uh, if you just count up the community partners involved in research and education and service across Feinberg and its affiliates, you know, primarily Lurie Children's Hospital and NMHC, and, and there's a few connections here through educational programs that span into the Evanston campus. We have about 1,200 community partners actively. Uh, and um, I, I just think it's remarkable the, the reach of this and, and where, what it's really become. So uh, again, um, community health, something that didn't seem like the starting place for a strategic growth in, uh, in public health research back in 2011 has really come far in 2023. Um, I will you know, say a few things over the next 20 minutes that really kind of center on things happening in the Institute that demonstrate key themes that I think have been important to our growth and important to the future. I wanna organize that according to some things that are about people, so individuals. Like I said, I can't talk about all 500, but I'll give you some examples that demonstrate themes. Places, which include um, really more like what our centers are doing, what they're like. Just to give you a flavor, I'll talk about a few. And then participation, which I'll, I'll begin by saying some things that are really measures of the collective productivity or impact of our membership with some select examples of some interesting things that I think are somewhat unique to IFAM. And then um, leaving you too with a little bit of uh, about how the individuals in our institute are not just doing their research under the umbrella of IFAM, but are actually using the opportunity to be on committees, to be in leadership roles, to be in structures that are outside of IFAM. They're in other institutes, they're in other programs, they have appointments that didn't exist before. And it's having an enterprise level of transformative effect on our campus. So I'll leave you with some examples of what I mean by that. Um, our institutes are each led by a director. Um, yeah, it's sort of the uh, kind of a South Park kind of moment here. The, uh, um, the, uh, we have a, these 18 realms or domains, and it, it's interesting that we started out again with community health and, and um, health services and outcomes in some of those lumpy areas, but we've really diversified in the way that we organize our centers. It's not random. Um, it's very thoughtful and purposeful. And I think one of the things IFAM has done as it's grown is try to be very thoughtful about the way that we create leadership positions. When people leave a leadership position and we want to replace that individual, we almost always try to have a search. Um, we don't want to assume or presume that somebody who's been here and working hard isn't interested in that opportunity. And we want people the opportunity to grow and to participate at multiple levels. Um, I want to talk a bit about um, our leaders. Our leaders here, these 18 leaders are in 12 different divisions uh, through departments at the medical school. So it it's really is a multidisciplinary affair. Um, they all sit on and meet monthly as members of our executive committee of IFAM, which is a place where we talk about major issues in public health education and research on our campus. And we strategize about ways to overcome challenges and to advance our work in different areas in the future. I'll tell you that it was at one of these IFAM uh, executive committee meetings where we were talking about big issues and limiting factors and things that keep us up at night. And uh, one of our directors said, you know, there's these funding opportunities now uh, from every, you know, institute, National Institute of Health uh, Center that require us to have an aim on implementation science. And NUCATS had, had begun a program on consultations about implementation, but we only had a few people here and there who were doing that work. And it was very difficult to meet the demand. Um, and it's where it's there where we began to think about strategies 
around implementation science growth um, that became exciting on the campus. So th these ideas, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, but these ideas sort of um, can form, these individuals have an opportunity to interact and bring ideas back and forth to the other roles that they have in uh, across the fabric of our campus. Um, we also are growing constantly, and here's some examples of new faculty that we've um, sort of, uh, you know, champion their appointments here uh, from from IFAM, and the, the, I will say that we've when when we've counted it up recently, there are over sixty faculty members that we've either led searches, um, collaborated with departments to uh, identify candidates and recruit people to those roles, or we've financed with resources available to IFAM. Uh, parts of the startup plan or the uh, the the, uh, uh, the the sort of um, movement of folks from outside the campus to to our campus. So over sixty people in the last twelve years are here with because of investments made by IFAM and and at least in part. Here's here's eight that we've contributed in a variety of ways. Several are in the growth of of a, of a recent center that we established last year, which is the Center for Dissemination and Implementation Science. Dr. Corey Bradley and Amelia Van Pelt, um, you know, came in through team science searches that were run nationally. And um, we've also added uh, Dennis Lee, who um, uh, basically was chosen from a national search for a, a tenure eligible investigator and, and had been working here on campus, uh, but actually is moving into a, a, a leadership and investigator role within the center. And uh, it's a new opportunity and slight career shift for him, uh, as well as uh, Zabine Patel, uh, who's also working in the Center for Dissemination Implementation Science with, uh, with Sarah Becker and other collaborators there. Um, Juliette Lumati started about a couple of months ago now. She is a global health researcher who's a uh, uh, a surgeon that uh, is interested in systems of care in Nigeria. So she does her work um, globally, but describes herself as interested in both health services, system science, and, and implementation science. Leslie Scolaris is a neurologist who um, is uh, playing important roles in CCH, overseeing some of the consult program there that uh, runs through uh, funding that's fueled by new cats and uh, also has an affinity and connects very closely with our Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research. Um, she came to us from, from Michigan. And then uh, recently uh, CCH added two additional faculty, uh, Dr. Ida Saluski and um, Alex Tabachnik. Um, so these are uh, you know, good examples of growing expertise in multiple departments that come into IFAM and continue to sort of contribute to this fabric. Um, there's also transitions, right? And IFAM doesn't exist without the partnership with departments. And um, some of those critical departments are medical social sciences, Department of Medicine, Department of Pediatrics, and Department of Preventive Medicine. We probably hired more people in those four departments uh, than, than any of the other departments over the last 12 years. And we've had leadership turnover in the four of them, really in the last year. Dave Sella stepped down about, a, I guess, a year and a half ago now. And through a highly competitive national search, we identified uh, Renad Betis. Many of us were on that search committee. We're very proud to have her here. Um, she does work that fits within our institute and, and does work in, as a social science scientist broadly, but as an implementation scientist. So she contributes to our Center for Dissemination Implementation Science has been a marvelous partner in recruiting already several additional faculty into her department. Um, Dr. Doug Vaughn, uh, Department of Medicine, was one of the chairs here when I arrived. He was my chair. Uh, he recently uh, stepped out of his role as department chair, I think for probably 15, 16 years, and uh, was replaced by Dr. Sue Quaggan, a nephrologist here who um, has been uh, a, a collaborator and supporter of uh, multiple investigators from her division who connect through IFAM. Uh, partly through our Center for Translational Metabolism and Health. So we're excited to work with both Renata and Sue around future growth and strategies for dry lab growth through their departments and their departmental faculty. Uh, Don Lloyd-Jones recently stepped down as depart the third department chair in the long history of Department of Preventive Medicine. Uh, and there's a national search underway for his replacement currently. 
Uh, and Dr. Matthew Davis, uh, who is the department chair of pediatrics, uh, has moved on as well. Both very important partners as well in IFAM's uh, growth and uh, committed to our mission. Uh, there are two active searches for both of those. I think a number of faculty within IFAM are on those search committees trying to contribute. We've also seen the departures of the city public health commissioner, uh, Allison Arwadi, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, Zike, Zike Ngoze um, from the state health department and had replacements of both of them uh, and are excited to work with both of them. We've met with uh, Samir uh, Vora to, with um, uh, the state uh, department and, and uh, we'll continue to sort of uh, 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 develop a relationship with our new city health commissioner who we welcome from New York and she's just arrived and started I think last week. So. Um, Change is always imminent and we just continue to roll along. It's what you have to do when you're focused on an enterprise level, but partnerships are really critical to the success of IFAM and it wouldn't exist without a relationship with these department chairs. I'll spend a little bit of time highlighting what it means to be a department, I mean, excuse me, an IFAM center. And um, you know, I think in general, the vision of IFAM is to, take strengths with, that exist within departments and create new opportunities that span them, departments and schools. And so, you know, our programs tend to be multidisciplinary. Our spaces or our places tend to be places where you're sitting next to not just people from your own department, but multiple other departments. And you might share resources like data or uh, pilot grants or funding of other sources. You might share staff who do work in project management to data analysis, et cetera. Uh, you might share partnerships like in a place like community health. And so there's an affinity in sitting together. In other cases, it's really a virtual community, um, but it's nearly always entirely multidisciplinary, which adds value to the existing department and for, uh, kind of structure of a traditional medical school. Um, I talked before about CDIS and I talked about how it grew out of two things. Um, I, I think, there's clearly a demand that was recognized far and wide for implementation science expertise. And um, part of that was the public health community and sort of thinking through this whole idea of research translation. Um, if we really want the products of research to be implementable and usable to practitioners and to policymakers, we, they have to be able to understand um, and have access to strategies that allow them to implement those research innovations successfully. And implementation science is sort of this natural field of, of uh, inquiry that really um, allows us to, to evaluate, package, describe implementation and, its, and implementation strategies in ways that make them reproducible or useful. Um, the other thing is like literally funding opportunities required an implementation science aim. And uh, the investigator community came together in 2021 in February in our school-wide five-year strategic retreat. And one of the key themes was implementation, two of the top five themes related to implement need for implementation science growth. And our executive committee came together and, and really um, took to the dean some ideas about strategies for that growth. And out of that came the Dean's commitment to establish, to recruiting a leader for implementation science on our campus. Um, we were able, uh, Dr. Tara Lagu helped to lead that search and, and uh, re really did yeoman's work trying to identify candidates, talk to them, bring them in, get them excited about the opportunity. Ultimately, it culminated in the successful recruitment of this incredible person, Sarah Becker, uh, who's not only moved her research here, but um, several people with her and created an environment that has grown way beyond the expectations. And one of the simple things, you know, that she was tasked to do when she got here was to deal with this pent up demand for implementation science expertise and consults. There was a queue of consults and not enough implementation scientists. Um, they organized the structure for requesting a consult and the way that they're vetted and addressed um, within the Institute, working collaboratively with new cats and, and we're able to actually respond to tally count and, and show the impact of their consults, which have grown 275% in, in a year. 
So it's really a dramatic, incredible um, thing that's, you, you know, sort of structural, but, um, but is, uh, it really was like an important demand on the campus and, and the center has come here and, and capably dealt with that demand. The other thing they did was to recognize that implementation science strengths already existed on our campus. And the center has done an incredible job tapping into the users and the strengths in implementation science and brought them into an, a, a group of collaborating investigators through the center. So they collaborate virtually. Uh, it gives credit to the strengths um, across that, that were here before in areas that were led by people like um, uh, in, 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 I don't want to leave anybody out, but you know, what comes to mind is, uh, you know, our, our Center for AIDS Research, our Institute for Sexual, Gender and Minority Health, um, our, our new cats and Center for Community Health um, investigators do a lot of implementation science. There's a lot of recognized expertise. Health Services and Outcomes does implementation science using similar methods. So all of this has been connected now through CETUS and there's a shared seminar and there's activities that they all work together. And um, strategically, it's really a great story of how um, IFAM can help to initiate um, and um, carry forward the strategy for growth in an area like implementation science. And it's now structural, it's part of our campus. We accept it as something we do. And if you ask people on the outside in the implementation science community, I think we're one of the, you know, we're gonna be one of the names on the list that come out of their mouth really quickly as a, as a top institution. And it, it's, um, you know, really a great success story. Um, I'm going to contrast that with our Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research. And the reason it's a contrast is because back in about 2017, um, Ruchi was one of those people doing incredible community-engaged research in our Center for Community Health. She had also done work that's health services focused, had been a member of the Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research for years. Um, but there was something about food allergy and asthma. There was a huge demand. And... Um, you know, the problem is, is the practice community and the policy community doesn't have a lot of epicenters for work that is specifically designed to be accessible to them to inform better practice and better policy in, 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 in um, addressing food allergy and asthma across the age spectrum. Um, so with Ruchi's help, we, we really devised this concept of a center for food allergy and asthma research. And rather than thinking this is something that we, everybody needs, right? Every, you know, we thought everybody needs uh, community health. Uh, everybody needs health services and outcomes. Everybody needs epidemiology. Um, food allergy and asthma is a deep strategy, right? It's going into an area very deeply. And the reason IFAM invested in it strategically was because we knew there was a West Coast center, there was an East Coast center, there was nothing in the Midwest and Rucci's work had already reached national and international recognition. So by organizing the center, we allowed wind to be blown in the sails of a group that um, she was able to bring together folks from pediatric and adult allergy, from different areas, as well as stakeholders, donors, identified new funding opportunities. But so just the very act of of establishing the center created a gravity for the growth in this research and pulled people in. And the growth has been exceptional. Not only does Rucci's um, uh, center or the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research um, do research and has a grown in people and research programs, but it, it does these global food allergy summits, these nationally ascribed to meetings and activities they have grants that are developing national data centers for food allergy and asthma that didn't exist before. So it's creating a scale effect on a field. Um, we've done this as well with aging. You know, it's another center where we said we decided to go into an area and, uh, and, and, and try to establish a center that would allow us to compete for a P30 and to have scale growth. And um, I think that that's been a successful strategy for us. So there's different versions of our centers, but they're all very strategic and very highly calculated and purposeful. Um, I wanna pivot from research to education. We have a center for education in the health sciences that um, you know, has integrated a number of uh, uh, educational programs, both in the classroom and also career development and training resources for postdocs and, and junior faculty. Um, we've had some leadership transitions there recently and uh, continued while we're growing. So this is, this is 
plane and flight analogy again, where things are constantly be re remodeled and built. Um, we welcome this year a new director of our Master of Science Biostatistics program, uh, Dr. Kwang Yoon Kim. Uh, uh, our um, newly launched Master of Science in Epidemiology program is led by Liz Hibbler. And our um, master, our largest master's program, our Master of Public Health, is led by Dr. Andrew Nadick. Um, these folks uh, together are uh, the leaders of our master's programs under the umbrella called the Program in Public Health, which is our unit of uh, national accreditation for public health training. We also have some other master's programs, um, some of them run through the center, some of them not, including um, a uh, Master of Science uh, Quality and Patient Safety, uh, Master of Science Health Services and Outcomes Research, and a um, outside of the center, a master, uh, uh, I think it's an MA, right? The Master of Arts in um, Bioethics and Medical Humanities. Um, this center has grown. Um, when I, how many are aware we have a PhD program? Oh, good. In 2011, we didn't. So um, we currently have 44 active trainees in our PhD program. We had zero in 2011. So the growth has been um, really, really quite dramatic there, you know, uh, but it's, um, it's an exciting program. This year we'll have seven new slots. There's 169 applications. It's a place people wanna be. It's got a national reputation. We're excited to support it and uh, it continues to grow. So I talked about our growth. We've got, um, 257 students in the Institute um, and trainees in the Institute last year. Um, I draw a contrast again to 2011. Uh, master's students, 123 uh, in 2011, 214 today. PhD was zero, it's now 44. And interesting on the career award path, um, we have a um, NIH reporter search that we do that actually searches for um, research funded by federal agencies that use keywords that it's carefully orchestrated. I won't get into details, but it's things like public health, population health, um, health services and outcomes, policy, implementation science, and the like. We've been running this year by year since uh, 2011. And when we do that by award type, we actually identify only one award that we had. And there are probably a couple more K awardees here back in 2011, but, but it was modest working in this sort of area, the spectrum of our research. Um, they're now 40. So um, the trainees have amplified considerably just in a 12 year period. Um, there are new centers. Some of them existed. You knew that there was a, some, many of you probably knew there's been for years a Center for Behavioral Intervention Technology. Um, one of the reasons it's coming into IFAM is to connect it to that executive committee, to be better connected to other parts of IFAM because it has a strategy for further growth. Um, so, you know, uh, we're, we're excited to accept in the, this year, the Center for Behavioral Intervention Technologies. We're excited for the future as a member of the IFAM community. And uh, so we don't always establish the centers, but we organize them in new ways and create opportunities that allow the leadership to achieve new goals strategically. Another is the Osher Center for Integrative Health. The Osher Center has been around um, for several years. It's one of 11 academic centers funded by the uh, Bernard Osher, Osher Foundation, um, dedicated to the study, teaching, and practice of integrated health, integrative health. Um, we are, uh, uh, just in September, we accepted uh, Osher into, uh, into our IFAM community, and, and uh, we're, we're excited about the, the opportunities to work collaboratively towards their further research growth across departments um, and service. Excuse me. I'm going to talk quickly through some of these particip participation slides, which first focus on some of the things that are metrics of what the collective of people in IFAM, these 500 investigators, are doing. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about how we try to promote um, communication about that participation in ways that raises interest and invites collaboration. Um, so. When Eric came in 2011, he said, we're gonna double research in 10 years. And we all thought, <laughs> you know, like that's gonna be really a lift, you know, like that's, cause we already had a pretty good research volume, but to double research. Um, and then he told us that we can't grow immediately that much in the wet lab. We're gonna try to, but we're limited by space. And until we build this building, um, the, Simps the, the Simpson Aquarii, uh, you know, scientific 
um, center, uh, we will grow in dry lab. Do people think it'd be audacious if we doubled dry lab research since 2011 and 12 years? So if you go to Project Reporter right now and you put in those keywords I was talking about and you run them in 2011 and year by year until 2023, 2022, because 2023 is not over for the calendar year, um, how much has dry lab growth at Feinberg grown in that period? Can I get a guess? Is, hey, who thinks it's doubled? Who thinks it's more than doubled? Okay. Three times? Five times. Anybody more than five? 10. Okay. Can't be 10. That'd be aspirational. We had 14 million in awards on Project Reporter in 2011, and there are 200 million today that fit those criteria. Um, it, it, it's a it's a serial cross-section of the growth in our work, our people, the commitment to working in the area of population and public health science and training. 14-fold um, increase over a 12-year period. Over that same period, if you flip and say, well, we're not interested in just Northwestern, we're interested in everybody else. Well, there has been a demand, right? There's been an increase in funding for this across the country, but it's increased threefold for every other institution other than Northwestern in the country. So it really is comparatively um, over the period of, and I won't say IFAM's uh, attributable to all this, but in the period IFAM's been here and this change in the fabric of our institution to focus purposefully on growth in these areas, population and public health science has grown 14 fold. Um, we make impacts in a variety of ways. Here are some nice uh, altmetric, uh, you know, we traditionally in academia, right? We measure how many grants, uh, do you have salary coverage? How many citations did you have last year? And that's about volume. It's about the volume of like our research and, and how much our research is talked about and referenced and shared. Um, we also can measure it in terms of stories or policy documents or other sort of different types of metrics that, that are also metrics of the volume of, of interest. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, several really high impact papers in the last few years, I wanna call out uh, Dr. Tara Legu, who's really, there's an interesting program, a really exciting program of research around um, disability advocacy and, and, and making sure that health systems um, really, if you think about a, a health disparity community that is highly vulnerable to bad health outcomes, uh, you know, people with disabilities are, are at the top of the list. They really are. And, and um, you know, to imagine that a health system is least prepared to care for people when they're disabled, like in a wheelchair or have, uh, require accommodations is really hard to wrap our minds around. And um, uh, Tara's, you know, work has begun to shine light. She does this collaboratively with lots of folks. Uh, in her center and and um, she's telling me, make sure to mention everybody, but I'm just saying like as a group, uh, there there has been a tremendous uh, light shined on uh, on on disability, the disability population and opportunity for scale growth. So these are the types of things that, you know, multidisciplinary centers make happen. Um, we have a media presence that promotes uh, Lots of things here, so lots of clips of information from our studies that have gone out on um, national media and social media and, and really reached millions and millions of individuals um, collectively. And, and there's an engine for doing that that spans everything from, you know, Northwestern Communications, Feinberg Communications, down to uh, Andrew Nellis, who's our communications lead within the Institute. And we do other things through communications purposely. Under this umbrella, we include... Uh, um, a bulletin that goes out weekly to several thousand people. And if you tally up how many of the emails were that, that counts up to in the last year, it's over 200,000. It's a lot of reach. You know, it's a lot about activities, about all of you and the, and the things happening across the Institute. I think it's designed really well. It's, it, it has a lot of impact on um, uh, re really communicating the work and impact of, of all of us. Um, our seminar series, which is held in this room usually on Thursdays, um, has hosted in the last year 26 
uh, leaders in their field and drawn uh, over 4,000 um, participants through Zoom or, or in person. Um, our population health forum occurs once a year. This year, it'll happen in, out in April. Uh, we're planning it now. Last year, um, it, our keynote was Dr. John Rich, um, who's uh, an expert in trauma-informed care that, that hospitals and emergency departments can, can be involved in. And he leads the, um, uh, the um, uh, Russia's uh, Institute, the uh, BMO Institute for, for Health Equity. So um, we'll hope for another exciting program this year, but we bring people together. We use communication tools to spread uh, and, and amplify impact. Um, here's a couple other examples. Uh, and I use these because they're not about what did my research project accomplish or what am I doing or what award did I get or who did we hire? But it has a scale effect on what we all do. So the Bueller Center um, has uh, two grants funding a drug data research center. Uh, and, and you know the drug data research centers are funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. And what they're doing is um, trying to organize data across multiple sources and systems in states to, um, to shine light on um, uh, opioid trafficking and outcomes. And they've created analysis, they're creating analysis tools for practitioners to use to actually make sense of the data and to respond to it to combat the overdose crisis. Um, that's not a research outcome. It's not an aim on an NIH grant. That is something that benefits the practice community and has a scale effect on, in creating opportunities for other scientists and, and innovators. Um, CDIS, uh, talked about before, but it, you know, uh, you know, in addition to just sort of helping with the nuts and bolts of implementation science, um, you know, it does work uh, that's very engaged with pract the practice community. And one example is just providing consultation and technical assistance about how treatment centers in multiple states implement contingency management, which is a, you know, form of behavioral therapy for addictions treatment. And it's important to understand that, you know, when you treat opioids, there's FDA approved medications that can complement behavioral interventions. But for stimulants, for example, there are no medication, I don't think, any medication treatments. So behavioral interventions that work are the only useful tool. And if treatment centers don't know how to implement them, that's a huge challenge and it creates, um, you know, it reduces the impact that a research can have in terms of evidence-based treatment. So they're specifically working with multiple states, both in the Northeast and out in California to try to speed the implementation and specifically support the practice community. CIPSI or the Center for Primary Care Innovation um, is one of multiple centers interested in this challenge of social determinants of health. How do we measure it? How do we, how do we understand it? How do we respond to it or them? Um, they went out and got a grant from HRSA, uh, the Health Resource Service Administration, back in 2016, basically to develop a collaborative to organize groups of individuals around a common theme of um, how do we create a practice community of people interested in training the healthcare workforce about social determinants of health. So as, the, as our understanding evolves in how we assess and how we respond to it, people have to know how to use those tools. People have to know they exist. SIPSI has created a web tool and a portal that allows uh, both the curation and the review and the presentation of those tools to the practice community. And beyond that grant, which ended in 2012, we continue to support that tool today to support the practice community and this sort of quest to further understand how we address social determinants of health. As I said before, our leadership, we don't just give people titles to be the head of a center in IFAM. Um, it's not a feather in a cap. It's not a shingle on a door. Um, they do come together in an important way, as I said, monthly to talk as a group around strategy that is campus-wide around population and public health research and training. Um, the process of bringing together people and having it be multi-departmental, as I described before, has created opportunities for them to lead in other parts of the campus. And I will say that seven IFAM centers today actually are part of other institutes in addition to IFAM. And I list them here. So we have spanning centers that have formed a critical role to the launch or the growth or the impact of other institutes. Again, part of the fabric. Um, 
In 2011, we couldn't imagine having a senior associate dean for public health at a medical school. There's only two senior associate deans um, on the medical school's uh, executive committee. It's the senior associate dean for public health, which uh, um, I'm the second that's fulfilled that or that, that sat in that role. Uh, the first was Dr. Bing Chang, and, and it's a role that the IFAM director uh, supports. But it is part of the strategy team for the dean's office that meets weekly. The only other senior associate dean is the, the head of, um, of the CTSA NUCATS, uh, currently uh, Dr. Rich DeQuilla, who's the senior associate dean for clinical translational science. The rest of the committee are all vice deans or the dean. Um, so that's an incredible place of power. It's a way to communicate. It's a way to share and gather information and bring it back to IFAM to further our own strategies and growth. Um, the dean also remarkably in about 2014-15, they looked at the mission of the school and restructure it to have five pillars, research, education, service, all medical schools have that, DEI, and community engagement. We have community engagement, the aspirational thing, is a mission pillar for a 160-year-old medical school. Um, it's remarkable, and the dean called um, called us together and said, "Bring together a council of everybody that's leading community engagement from different institutes, from um, NMHC, from Lurie Children's Hospital, from some of the folks at the Evanston campus. Coordinate, um, facilitate that meeting, and try to align those strategies in a way that allows us to have greater impact. Um, that sort of leadership. Multiple uh, center directors are part of that." Dr. Sarah Becker is one of the multi-PIs of the new cats. I guess it's 4.0, the submission that'll be reviewed, I think, in March. Um, you know, incorporating leadership uh, from IFAM centers into the leadership of other institutes is also really a powerful thing. And I will say that there are multiple um, uh, members of, of IFAM that are institute directors. Two center directors, Abel Coe, our director of uh, CHIP, and um, Dr. Rob Murphy, the second largest center in IFAM in 2011 was the Center for Global Health, got so successful, it became its own institute. So he now directs the institute. And, and so um, that's a great success story for, for a, an institute for public health and medicine. It's empowering leaders to have an impact across our campus. Um, and would you believe we have a um, chief ethics officer of, of something as important as uh, data strategy in, in, in IAIM, uh, Dr. Kelly Michelson, the director of our Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities. Finally, I'll just say that uh, Melissa Simon in her role as uh, director of uh, Center for Health, uh, uh, for, um, Health Equity Transformation, she has spent her entire career really invested on health equity research and community engaged research. And um, one thing that she's done that's just remarkably unique is invest her time and resources into the development of other people who um, are diverse scholars who wanna work in the health equity space. And I think it began, she's probably had multiple grants, but one that we're aware of is this um, T37 award that's funded graduate to postgraduate trainees from diverse backgrounds to enter careers in health equity uh, research. And it's a, it's a great career development um, sort of uh, platform. Melissa is one of three PIs for the Nurture Award. And the Nurture Award uh, is funded by HHS and by the National Institutes as a way to um, basically catalyze uh, recruitment and support of tenure eligible faculty that identify with uh, diverse social backgrounds to be successful in academia. Um, we were the first institution in the Midwest to receive a first award. Last year, we had over 100 applications. It was really amazing to think that a, over 100 diverse, aspiring diverse faculty scholars or people aspiring to careers in academic medicine from diverse backgrounds wanted to be at Northwestern. This year, there's 436 applicants. So kudos to Melissa and her collaborators, uh, her other PIs are Eric Peralt and uh, Clyde Yancey in leading nurture and this sea change in the way that we think about faculty and career development. I'll leave you briefly in the interest of time with a few things. I think we have an institute that's devoted to impacting policy and practice. And sometimes policies are decided by one person at the right time in the right room. They don't read research reports, right? So simply showing impact by counting citations and tweets and policy, you know, 
it's it's undercounting the impact. And um, I think about how will we do that better three to four to five to seven years from now. One thing we've done um, over the last 10 years is contribute to changes to our promotion and tenure policies at the medical school. Um, so that team scientists, as an example, can go up for promotion and get credit and uh, be seen as making progress for promotion based on impact and community engaged scholarship. And we help define what that is and how it could be measured and how it would be judged. So we need to do the same for other areas. Um, the same is true in community impact. We wanna show community impact, but do we really know how to measure community impact? Um, I'm not sure if it's dots on a map showing our partnerships. That's important, but it's insufficient. Um, we do larger science. And what I didn't show you in that 14 fold increase in our research portfolio is that a lot of it is driven by P's and U's. But innovation is investigator initiated and it's often multi PI R awards. And the budget for an R01 from NIH has not changed since I think 1993. So if we want bigger grants and hybrid trials and multi-site, multi-investigator research, we have to write them months in advance to request special approval to have a big budget, or we've got to wait until some rare P or U opportunity comes along. I'm not sure, we need to think proactively about how we sort of change the architecture for research to, to fulfill the need for these larger grants. Um, social determinants of health, I talked about that. There's more that we don't know than we do. We're a medical school with 600-ish or more medical students at any point in time. 40 are getting a dual degree in MD, MPH. That's huge. That's the largest sort of group of, uh, you know, it's a very large subset of our public health trainees, that's like 40% in, in any year. Um, should we be the medical school where, I mean, we need more physicians trained in population health science and leadership. Should we be the school that's known nationally as the opportunity to get a dual degree? What's the right number? Um, and then we know that our clinical partners are building facilities, Lurie Children's out in Austin and NM down in the Bronzeville community. Um, we also know that we need to be careful when we engage with community partners not to presume um, you know, the, those clinical partners are, are trying to address unmet healthcare needs and access needs in vulnerable communities in our city. If we descend and say, we're here to do research, it's not gonna be received that well. And we need to be very thoughtful about how we can develop respectful programs of research that really do advance the needs of those communities. And um, that's a challenge I think about. Some of these things may seem aspirational to you, but I would say that I think that we can achieve them. Who would have thought 12 years ago that we would grow to have 18 centers, um, that our research would grow 14 fold, that our graduate trainees would double, or that community engagement would be a fifth mission pillar of a 160 year old medical school. I think that the things that seem aspirational today are achievable, but they're only achievable with all of you working collaboratively as you have been within our institute and the additional roles you play across campus. I wanna thank you all and thank you for attending today. Um, it's a celebration of IFAM and I hope for those who can, you'll show up tomorrow at our uh, two o'clock at the D4 for our celebration of another year of success in IFAM. Thank you.